Welcome everyone. Welcome to Dying Your Way. I am more than delighted that I could say to have the guests that we have on for today's podcast. We have Peter and Elizabeth Finnick, and we have my husband, co-founder of Dying Your Way, Terry Meppham. Um, Peter and Elizabeth Benick are co-authors often, and they're off authors separately. Uh, Peter is a neuropsychiatrist, and he is a professor emeritus at King's College in London. And his body of work has been about near-death experiences and reincarnation and putting a focus on dying well in a society that has pretty much lost the art of dying which happens to be the name of his book that I will talk about later on. Um, yeah, I, I have to say to both of you, when we had some friends that were in India and they were, um, we were house sitting for them for a year. And she's a, she's a palliative care doctor here in the Bustleton area in Western Australia. And she had at least three or four of your books at the same time that I was writing uh, the Dying Your Way portal, and it was just a gift to me to be able to um, read your work and um, feel validated in what I was doing. It was very validating to uh, get your insights. And of course, you've got a lot of things that are posted on YouTube and TED Talks, and yeah, people will have to go exploring after this conversation for themselves. Um, so welcome to all of you. I'm <laughs> really happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. I am, I'm just really curious how your journey from being a neuropsychiatrist led you to near-death experience work, or was it the other way around? No, it's, a, it's an interesting question, that. In fact, uh, I was a neuropsychiatrist and a neurophysiologist. And I was uh, at St. Thomas's Hospital running the neurophysiology department. And Raymond Moody's book came up over the horizon, uh, <clears throat> near death experiences and his accounts of them. And I knew straight from the outset that it was all rubbish. Uh, <laughs> this happened in California, it would never cross the Atlantic. And uh, so I just put it in that pile of books that really are unimportant. And then into my consulting room came this guy. He'd had a cardiac catheter at a uh, London hospital, which had gone wrong. He'd had a near death experience and he'd got a chronic anxiety state uh, following it. And he came to me because he was anxious. Well, of course, he was a prime example of exactly what Moody said. He had uh, the leaving the body, he had going down the tunnel, he had going into the light, he had conversations in the light, he saw dead relatives, he had a life review. I mean, it was a whole picture. Great and question. When I speak question. What, was he anxious because he had that experience? No, he was anxious because he'd nearly died. Oh, okay. In, in his, you see, when he came out of his body, he yeah. saw all the people desperately trying to resuscitate him. And that made him really anxious. Then when he turned down the tunnel, of course, this, this okay. wasn't a, a problem anymore. Yeah. At any rate, uh, I, I listened to his story and I had to make up my mind. Had he just recently been to California? <laughs> <laughs> or was this real? No, it was real. So I became interested in it oh. because this was clearly an extension of consciousness. But the interesting thing, it was um, uh, a, 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 an extension that you could study. I have to ask another question. I hope you don't mind if it's not too personal. How old were you when you met this patient? How long ago? Uh, 40. You're 40 years um, old? About 40 years ago, I should think. I always think it's about that. Yeah. Idea. I can't remember the first. Um, 88 was 83 first. was my first BBC transmission yes. on it. And 82 was when Moody's book came out? No, around? 72. 72. Oh, really? Yeah. As long as yeah. yeah. 
Likewise, yes. And um, the, the, because I became interested in it, I was known uh, that I was interested because I started uh, publishing data on it. And the BBC asked me to uh, co-host uh, a programme called Glimpses of Light. Glimpses uh, of Death. Glimpses of Death, <laughs> sorry. Same thing. Okay, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Nice. Just the reverse, yes. yeah, there you go. Um, and so I did that. And then we got um, 2,000 letters in response. Wow. Do you remember letters? These are the things you <laughs> I <open>. do. <laughs> <laughs> None of this clicking stuff. And so we looked through those and I selected 500, which were, I felt, the sort of core experiences that people had. And then I sent out a questionnaire so as to standardize the data. And that really was what our first book, The Truth and the Light, uh, was written on. It was, a, I think we had 350 or 400 replies at that time. We got 450 altogether. And so that gave us a very, very good uh, idea of the range of near-death experiences. But the interesting thing there was that when we looked at uh, what caused them, it was protein. There were Every type and shape of thing. Sitting in front of the fire warmly at home was enough to trigger one in some people. Oh. Um, obviously, childbirth, uh, serious illness, um, heart attacks, uh, you name it, it was in the list. And so it became quite apparent to me that near-death experience is universal. And uh, it, okay, it's tied to brain function in some way, but you'll never really understand it unless you look at the time when the brain is apparently not functioning. That's you'll get your best data. Mm. So we chose heart attacks and uh, started our, one of our studies on patients who had near-death experiences and heart attacks with the argument that there was no brain working at that time. And that wow. became interesting. It develops a, a, a lot of controversy. <laughs> and uh, well, I was going to ask you. So, what did all of your your scientists and doctor friends think of you doing that work? And Elizabeth, what did you think about him going off in this direction? Well, I I am um, I I'm not really a scientist. I read medicine at Cambridge, which was where we met. Um, but I didn't, I would, it was really one of those things you talk yourself into because it seems a very worthwhile career and you have a vague interest. But then I decided I actually didn't want to be a doctor. <laughs> and so what I really like doing is writing. And so I started and did some journalism for a few years and wrote several books on things that were nothing to do with death and dying, childbirth and child guidance, all that sort of thing. But you were um, generally supportive of what he was doing? Well, yes, I could. The thing is, he's slightly dyslexic and he can talk wonderfully. But when he puts things down on paper, they, they, they get garbled. <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm an ungarbler. <laughs> sort of works, that one. <laughs> and so it works very well. And... As for the death and dying, that was interesting because um, it's a very difficult concept to have a true belief in unless you've either experienced it yourself or else, as happened to Peter, um, you meet somebody that you, whose opinion you really trust and you know that they're speaking the truth as they see it. Yeah. And... Um, I was very sort of, I thought very interesting topic, but I think it wasn't until I met an old school and college friend who told me that she had had, you know, she described the actual experience she'd had. It was after a skiing accident. And mm. I believed her. I mean, what she was saying was what happened. And so it made me it, well, it made me open-minded, which is what I, I needed to be at that time. And your friend believed it. Sorry? Your friend who was telling you the story believed what had happened to her. It's a question. Yes. 
yeah absolutely and so and, and it was a very valuable thing because these people are they are telling stories which are in a sense beyond belief so you have to suspend your false beliefs and say have i actually experienced this myself no so i can't really say one way or the other can i but i believe what they're saying i've i've had two personally oddly enough and i'm still here to talk about it and and they were very different one was uh i i just could feel the life force going out of my body i was hemorrhaging from a surgery that I was had and I was home and I was hemorrhaging and I could literally feel the life force going out of me and it was very frightening. And um, that, I mean, that's the short story of it. Uh, the other time was a, a car accident that I had where a, a truck pulling four horses, so huge truck hit me broadside and I, um, was going off of the road and was just so matter of fact, like this is, this is how I'm going to die. It was just like, I wasn't scared at all. I was like, this is it. <laughs> and I was repeating a mantra that I say a lot. And I, as I was going in and out of consciousness, the mantra, I couldn't repeat it anymore, but the mantra was repeating itself inside me. And I was totally calm, totally without pain. There was no experience of fear in that moment at all. And it wasn't until later when they were pulling me out of the car that I was in tremendous pain. But um, yeah, it was, if you experience it, you do become a believer, <laughs> you know, it was. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. And my father had had, um, when he was dying, you know, he was speaking to relatives that had passed on. He go, oh, sweet, do you see him? They're here, and there's, oh, there's Freddie, and there's Sloan, and he's, he, he looked at me like, I know you don't see what I'm seeing, and I was just, I don't, but I totally believe that you do. <laughs> so we just had yeah. a good laugh about it, and maybe, you know, 12 hours later, he was gone. Uh, it, it's fascinating. Um, the reason that we got into death and dying from near-death experiences is that uh, I was wondering whether the uh, near-death experience was part of the dying process or not. Mm. And so the thing that we had to do then was to go and look at people who were actually dying. And of course, you uh, immediately start with um, the literature. And uh, when we re read, read it, uh, it was quite clear that deathbed visitors were common and that, uh, um, what was the name of the guy who? Uh, Bruce Grayson, which no, one are you talking no, about? The... Uh, the one in the 20s who wrote the book. Oh, um, yes, he was a, his wife was a gynecologist. What was his name? It was the first book on these experiences. Um, what, how far back, like in the... It was about 1920. 1920s. His wife was an obstetrician and she told him about um, a patient of hers who had had an experience and that's what, persuaded him to examine it in, yeah. in more detail. And I'll probably remember the name of the guy by the end of the program. But <laughs> yeah. 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 It starts with a B. Yes. The, the interesting thing about, about this particular experience was that his wife, oh, yes. when he was attending the woman, uh, her mother, I think it was her mother, who was alive, came to see her and uh, she reported this. Now it was always thought that it was dead people. So uh, he was uh, convinced that uh, it must be wrong. But in fact, they found out later that her mother had just died. So in fact, it, it all fitted in very nicely mm. and that's what prompted the study. 
but that that really was my my, my same path that um, did the near death experience indicate anything about the actual process of death and so um, I was very lucky because uh, I was able to get a research grant uh, from the BL Foundation, who a wonderful foundation. Thank you, BL. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, that allowed me to go into to form a team and go into hospices, etc. And the thing that we found very, very marked was that there are two stories going on in the hospices. I don't know what it's like in in Australia. The medics say, no, it's hallucinations. This is of no interest. People come in here, they hallucinate and their sodium's wrong and they don't have enough water, etc. So you don't have to believe that. And then they die and that's the end of it. Whereas the nurses said, no, it's not right. Uh, we see a lot of these things and they are very, very meaningful to the people who are dying. And to dismiss them as hallucinations uh, is to miss the whole point because they are, are comforting, they are indicating A, when they're going to die, because they'll usually give you a date, and B, they will um, uh, uh, come back for you to guide you through it. Uh, I met a fascinating doctor from Canada. No, it was a nurse actually. And uh, she was more or less in charge of a hospice way up in British Columbia. And she said, nobody dies alone in my hospice. Now I didn't believe that for a minute because being as far away as she was, there were obviously going to be times when people couldn't get to the hospice and some of her patients would die alone. So I said, how come? And she said, well, when people are getting close to death and they don't have any visitors, what they do is, what I do is to say, who do you think will come and collect you? Interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> and by that time, that's, <laughs> it seems to be truer for them. And so they say, oh, I don't know, Mary, my, my grandmother, she'll come. And then, the nurse each morning would say, have you seen Mary yet? And the person would say, no. And then one morning the person said, yes, Mary was here yesterday. And she said, next time Mary comes, go with her. Mm -hmm. That's exactly mm -hmm. what happened. And I think that's a wonderful way of using deathbed visitors, in fact. They give you this kind of there are There are doctors that, you know, I can name that are just absolutely fabulous and very much a part of um, using um, human skills, I would say, supporting, you know, people that are on their deathbed. And I listen to the news about the, the ICU people that are with COVID patients. And really, in some ways, they're experiencing the deathbed experience themselves as clinicians for the first time and are woefully aware that they don't have the skills and the training to support the, the spiritual and emotional and um, holistic needs that are really probably more important than the physical needs of the patient at that time. Um, what, what are you seeing now with, not necessarily because of COVID, but just because death has been removed and sanitized in our culture. So what are you both seeing um, that is the reality and what could be improved? Just either one of you, what, what comes to mind? Do you want to go? Um, <laughs> Got you. Yes. Oh, yes, okay. Can you hear our cat? The cat can go. Let the cat go. Yeah, cat. <laughs> Come and show yourself to all the Australians. Um, I, I think, first of all, we could do a lot more teaching. Um, I have, uh, uh, we have nine grandchildren between us and two of the, three of them will probably go into medicine. One of them has just completed his medical course and I asked him, what have you been taught about um, 
palliative care? He said, well, nothing really. Um, we were told that hospices exist, but really nothing more than that. And I said, did you go to a hospice? And you were able to talk to dying people. Oh, no, nothing like that. And mm -hmm. so the first thing we can do is we can actually tell medical students what death is like. Um, ours has changed. I don't know. Do you think we need to? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so that, that's the first mm -hmm. thing. Second thing is to try and normalize it. Yeah, you are in fact um, going to die. So first of all, accept that. And it's, it's no big deal because there are people there who will come and look after you. Uh, the, um, the deathbed visitors, they'll be there. And then we found that people uh, go into a transcendent realm the deathbed visitors will take them into a transcendent realm, show them the realm, and then back into the hospice again. And yeah, we lost the sound there. Let's see. Is it the modem? So uh, they get familiarized with this area, and then the date is set for when they'll go. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's very important but you you must be familiar with the work of Monica Renz. I'm you know not. Monica Renz? Oh, hurry up. <laughs> She'll now. do for a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you must do a podcast with Monica. You'll love it. Okay. She's palliative care theol I'll send you her email address. Palliative care theologian in Zurich. And oh. she's done a wonderful number of studies and she's got she talks about the transitions, pre-transition, transition, post-transition, post and this is what happens before, and uh, then a little gap, and then you come up to the actual death itself. And the thing which interested me is uh, that uh, people get a change in their mental state. The first, the first part is clearing, cleaning, giving up, uh, getting rid of attachments all that so it's something you can tell the dying people get rid of your attachments you're not going to want them and then uh transition is it's a little bit more complex but you're beginning to lose your ego you've lost your ego structure and you're really without without it then you become non-dual just before you die so in becoming non-dual you become cosmic so, so I think everyone becomes non-dual. I mean, is that her theory that everyone becomes non-dual just through the, just through about the, eighty percent. Eighty percent. Okay. Her figures are eighty percent. That's amazing. Um, oh, it's totally amazing. Um, so we have to look at death as something quite different. Mm -hmm. It is, in fact, an expansion of consciousness. Horrible words to say, <laughs> rather than a ruling out. Turning why, why is that yeah. horrible expansion of consciousness? Why is that horrible? It's not. It's absolutely wonderful. But most oh. of my colleagues would say, Peter, you're mad. <laughs> Go home. But fortunately, it's all founded on data. This mm -hmm. is what the dying experience at that time. But I'm, I'm sure from everything that I've learned and um, I've, I've, I try to think, I think probably I've only been at one actual deathbed, which was my brother's. I missed my mother's and my father's. <clears throat> but the one thing which was really apparent that I learned was that you have to, you have to resolve any emotional problems that you have, any, any feuds that you've had with people, um, if you can get your relationships right before you die, then I would have said that you've removed one of the big barriers to a, to a peaceful death. Um, so I think that's another important thing to, to um, teach people so that they're ready for it. I don't know how much, I don't know how much attitudes have changed in England in hospices now. Do you feel that most hospice directors are more receptive to the idea than they were when we first started working in the field? Well, there's a hospice quite near to where we are here um, in Scotland. 
and uh, the director there said none of these things happen Peter um, <laughs> and I said okay well can I come and talk at the hospice and we'll talk to we'll have all the palliative care nurses in etc and the other clinician and uh, he organized that which was very good of him and of course the nurses kept on saying yeah we recognize that we recognize yeah. that we recognize that and so at the end he said well maybe i have to believe you and <laughs> another palliative uh, care host another hospice in fact I, I gave the findings for that hospice and he said peter are you sure you didn't get your data mixed up <laughs> I mean, it's fascinating. Fascinating. Yes, I mean, the first hospice he approached in London, which was a very well-known hospice, and I won't even mention its name, but the director said, look, very, almost aggrieved, I think, and said, nothing like that ever happens in my hospice. <laughs> so it was a sort of personal failure of his <laughs> patient started seeing these things. I can't believe that it's as bad now. Terry? Yeah, we would hope that it is changing. I know that um, I was interested to hear you talking about um, letting go of things. And we, when we left, because um, we met in New York and then we went to New Zealand where I'm from originally and we went and visited my brother who was in end stages of cancer. And he was a real warrior and he used to say, well, I mean, he was very open about uh, that his life was coming to an end and he would even spoke with his grandson and you know, told him that, you know, grandpa was not going to be around for much longer. But he said to us one day, you know, he, he didn't know what was going to happen. You know, that was the only thing afterwards. And I nearly, I wanted to hit him across the head and say, look, You've done it all before. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. And um, eventually, we weren't there when he when he passed. But the morning that he left, I think he's he was lying in bed, and and his wife said, "You're ready to leave, aren't you?" And he said, "Yeah." He he'd relaxed. He'd he'd accepted that it was time. And she said, "Well, you know, don't worry about anything. You know, don't worry about me. You, you're fine to go." And he died that morning. And then one of our, our nieces, um, the daughter of our younger brother, he visited her in a dream a couple of days later. And he said to her, I don't know why I was worried. He said, it was really easy. He said, mum and dad were there to meet me. And, you know, it was a beautiful experience and I had nothing to worry about. And um, so he had, he had got to that point where he could relax. But then I was thinking what I was reminded, I was listening to one of your talks today and what I was reminded of was my father. He had a different experience because he died um, nearly 35 years ago. I was, in, um, I was in Australia, I think. And then, but um, we didn't have a good relationship. We had some stuff between us and the last time I saw him was when he dropped me off on the side of the road and I hitchhiked up to uh, up to um, to Auckland in New Zealand to catch a plane to fly to Australia and then I went to India and um, and he died later well he died in 1985 it was the year that I'd got married and um, I was in India in 1992 and because I'd had a real struggle with my father, we, I had issues um, that were still plaguing me and self-consciousness was one of them. And I asked my guru, I said, you know, how do I deal with this? And she put me on to this guy called Sharmaji. And he turned out to be an Indian fellow that had brought past life therapy to the West. So we sat down and we had a chat and he got me talking about my father in, in the third person. And he said, you know, if he was here now, I'd give him a real good talking to because um, he, you know, he, he didn't treat me so well. And then he said, told me to go off and, and talk out loud and read and just do some stuff. 
meantime, uh, and I was to meet him later that day, when I met him, he said he had met my father, he had spoken with him, and he said that he um, had been unable to move on in his journey because of the amount of regret oh. that he had. And this was seven years after he had died, and he still hadn't been able to, to carry on in his journey because yeah. of the, the weight of regret of how he had treated me. Well, Shamaji spoke to him and said, he's okay now. He's in a good place. He's well looked after. He's, um, I was under the guidance of, of a, a great saint, so my life was, was in good shape. And he was then able to release all of that anxiety that he had had and was able to move on in his journey. Um, and that was, yeah, so that really brought me into that knowing of we have to let go. We can't take this stuff with us. If, if, yeah, if we don't sort it now, you know, it can last that long. And... Um, and and a big part of what I'm I was drawn to in this in the dying your way movement that we've created that was just to help people get over the fear of the unknown and not worry about what is coming you know to really enjoy it and to experience it and listening to you and the and the near death experiences that people have the great majority of them are really lovely, sublime, loving experiences. And if you, yeah, combine, cool. if you combine what what he just said with what Elizabeth said, you know, it's just about if you, you, if you prepare before you get on your deathbed and clear out all of those emotional things beforehand, you won't have to wait around seven years after you die to go. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's a very, very, very worthwhile knowing that. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things Monica did uh, was she correlated the attitudes of people um, before they came into the hospice and when they came into the hospice with suffering, anxiety, fear, and uh, transcendence. So she, she, the correlations with all of them. And uh, obviously the people who suffered least were those who had had a near death experience. They knew what it was like, there was no problems for them. Yoga, prayer, meditation all helped, but there was one group and that was the group who were curious as to what would happen. They did extremely well. And I think really one of the things you can tell the dying people is be curious about what's mm. happening. And if you think about that, try and hold fear and be curious. You can't. And right. so the fear grows and you look forward with a curious, mm -hmm. much more open mind. So I, I think that's a, a really good thing. I'm so gonna, I tell people now, if you're going to die, be curious. I'm going to use that. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Yes. Yeah, I, I think it's worthwhile. Wonderful. Well, Terry and I are, you know, very um, involved in the death and dying community. And because of the internet, it's now a global movement. So we are work with um, the International Doula Association, with the Australian Doula Association. I mean, we're really um, working with doulas to walk that journey and be advocates for patients from the time of diagnosis and till the end. So people, in our opinion, are involved in hospice way too late. And now you can be in full curative mode and get palliative care with it. And that makes the transition into hospice care much more seamless. And um, it's, it's just something that we feel passionate about that in this day and age, no one needs to die in pain or fear or in anxiety. And that's what our goal is with what we're doing. And we use the internet primarily to consult and teach and work with people. So being able to speak with you, I mean, you please just give us any kind of advice you want because we're here 
with you today to listen to anything you have to teach us or to teach our audience. Yes, uh, I have one question for you. Okay. Uh, fast forward 10 years. Okay. And um, the ability to uh, go to a clinic in Switzerland is now everywhere. And so if you want to die, you can ring up your GP and providing there are certain characteristics, you know, you've got a terminal illness, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, he'll come along and give you uh, uh, an overdose of, of an anesthetic, really. So you go unconscious and then, then your heart stops. What is your view of that? Do you think people... I'm shaking my head. You're the second person that's asked me that today. Oh, yeah. and, oh well, you're well prepared then. <laughs> I, I am. Well, I mean, we've both talked about it a lot because you do get... Um, clients that you work with that are just ready to go and it's just not happening fast enough. Yeah. Um, we, we promote natural death. So we're not, we're not trying to prolong it. We're not trying to shorten it. It's, um, and more than anything, I think we just want to empower people to make their own choices and to make it earlier rather than later. And we're here to give them the tools that they need to, answer their questions, whether it's very practical questions or whether it's, you know, needing emotional support or spiritual support. Um, I am, I'll just speak from my own experience and you can tell me what you think, Terry, but if, if I knew I was close to the end, I would probably do the uh, voluntary removal of eating and drinking just because from the studies that I've read and done that that's a very even euphoric way to go. And it's a very um, patient driven way to go. And it's, it does promote a natural death. If you didn't have all of the bells and whistles that you get in ICU, I do want to die at home. I don't want to be in a hospital tethered to anything, you know, I mean, that's just my personal goal. And, that's the goal probably of 80% of the people that we work with, but 65% of the people are going to be in an ICU, you know, or in a hospital when they go. And um, it's everyone's choice. I mean, what, what do you think? Um, yeah, same sort of thing. It's, I'd like, I like the full experience of life and dying is part of that. And what, leads up to that is also a part of that and, and should not be missed. Um, you know, I don't like the idea of prolonged pain and suffering, but palliative care can take care of that. But one of the things that I read my guru say one time was that pain is your friend, because at that time, you are burning off so much karma in such a short time. And the idea is to um, to get rid of all of that stuff and karma is something that keeps bringing us back you know the impressions that we create and the idea is to is to clear clear your life and you know going through a bit of pain um, if it's going to save you lifetimes um, of, <laughs> of coming back you know that's a that's a pretty good deal but the idea, you know, um, that um, yeah, shortening your life unnaturally is is not something that I would ascribe to. But um, but it's a choice. It's if a someone cho wanted so, yeah. to do the it's volunteer volunteer assisted dying through mm -hmm. a physician, I mean, we would probably support them to to figure that out. You know, yeah. I mean, I feel it's a choice. Yeah, and as Claire says the removal of, of food and, and drink uh, you actually use more energy trying to digest food than you do um, if you don't have it and the body can stay alive longer um, with less stress uh, if you know in those circumstances and so that would be probably the um, recommended way i mean it, it, like claire says it, it allows a natural death but, um, what do you think, Elizabeth? 
I, I feel very, very strongly, I think, that if this is a natural part of the dying process, I don't see how we could argue that it depends on the way you die. I mean, whether you die in your sleep, whether you die from the COVID virus or an accident or a or whether you, somebody gives you a, an injection so that you just die peacefully then and there. I cannot believe that that is going to deprive you of an experience. These, they don't take place necessarily. Uh, we hear of the ones that take place in clear consciousness, but I don't feel that that in any way means that if you're not in clear consciousness, you don't have the experience. That makes no sense to me at all. I think it's a universal experience. If it exists, and I think it does. Mm. I think you can argue <clears throat> that um, the rapid transitions, for example, a car crash, um, falling off a mountain, <laughs> whatever, um, uh, the people who have near-death experiences clearly go through the whole process uh -huh. and it looks as if um, that is the process that you're going to go through. Um, I, I very much like the idea that uh, you can burn off a lot, of, a lot of karma in the process, but I think a lot of this is preparation actually. I uh -huh. think people when they go into hospices should be prepared. Um, I mean we have to learn every other skill why don't we learn a skill about how to die? It's, it's, it's so straightforward. And of course, in Victorian times, it was very different. When I would have had two or three siblings of mine who had died, I'd know what death is. I might even have lost my mother in childbirth. You'd have all the grandchildren around you too. <laughs> yes. yes. That's very important. Yes. We actually so, did that with my mother. We, she was at home when she died and we had all the family around and people were singing and telling tales and yeah is that yes, yes yes i think that's the way to go <laughs> we can create it but elizabeth I, I i i agree with you that it's your choice and if that's someone that has thought about it as an informed medical decision and they have the medical support and the palliative support to do that i would move heaven and earth to support a client to do that i would never take away anybody's choice because that's you know, I just know what I would do, but that I, I'm never going to impose that on anybody else. I should be so lucky that, you know, I get it to happen the way I want it to happen. But because we don't know, I just want to be prepared. And I try to prepare my clients, you know. And I bet you're not frightened of it, are you now? You're not, not frightened of it? No. Um, not at all. Mm -hmm. And I think the big thing is, is what um, you were saying, Peter, is that, it's about education. It's about knowing what's coming, coming and, and preparing yourself for that. Whether it's, um, you know, that you um, hasten it along or you tough it out. But the idea of that death is a, a sacred experience and, and it's a transition and it's a moving to another realm. Um, if you know that that's what awaits you and you can get rid of the fear. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. And, and one of the things that um, I really like about the um, interview I saw, watched you with is, was about yeah those near-death experiences and, and um, death experiences that people have and just the beauty of them. And people knowing that would take a lot of the fear yeah. away. Yes, it, it means we have to go back a little bit further uh, because I'm a psychiatrist, uh, minds and brains. Um, I, you, you get many patients or some patients who come and tell you they want to die. They want to kill themselves because they're depressed. Now, um, should I hand them the means to do it. I mean, obviously not. What I do is I give them antidepressants, their mood changes, and, you know, they go on enjoying their life. Now, uh, what 
are you going to do with the people who you feel have just got profoundly depressed and want to end it all? I mean, you, you, you're obviously not going to fill them up with antidepressants. That would be silly. No, I mean, I think there's, you know, uh, we have links for cognitive behavioral therapy and I would just get on the, you know, I, searching the kind of support that they needed and you know certainly suicide hotlines and things like that but it's not finding someone like yourself i mean it's uh i mean i had an uncle who committed suicide and it was the trauma that that inflicted on people that remained i mean it's um yeah i mean it's it affects so many people, the people that do commit suicide, it affects so many people in that ripple effect in the realm. And my father was just like, you know, he, he just said it was a murder. It, it wasn't a suicide, it was a murder. And that's just what I'm gonna say, sweet. I mean, it, that's how he had to like deal with it in his mind that his brother was murdered, that he couldn't have committed suicide. So, yeah. you know, I would just love for, for people that are out there that are thinking about it to know that there is help out there. And it's just so important to, to reach out and, um, you know, there's, you tell someone, someone that you trust that can uh, help you through it and walk you through it. It's, you need professional, yeah. you need professional help. You need professional you help. Need the, 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 it's a little gap as you come up to death. Um, all these people are going to die, but as they come closer, some get very depressed by the process. I think really what we're saying is that it's proper care for the individual in, in, the, process, in the times that you come up to death. And then of course, it's no longer a question. Yeah, I, so when you asked me that question, I was thinking about someone who did not have a chronic pro progressive illness. Yeah, that's a whole that's a whole nother thing that really needs yeah. a lot of support. You know, um, and again, a combination to me of something like cognitive behavioral therapy and medication. You know, or uh, just talking, just talking. I agree. Yes. Getting a puppy. <laughs> We're very much on the same page there. <laughs> yes. I remember reading about, um, I think it was a Buddhist community, and they lived out, you know, in, in, the, um, in the wilderness, in, the, in nature. And when somebody came that was disturbed, they would be put in a little hut away in, in, in a beautiful natural setting and just left there, you know, fed and left to themselves. And more often than not, just being in nature alone mm. helped mm. and cured a lot of angst. Um, yeah. Because there's, there's nothing there to fight against. And, and so it, it had a, an amazing effect. And I know the effects of nature are, are very healing um, for a lot of things. And, I mean, that's... That's why you go in the ocean every day. That's why I go in the ocean every day. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it's the middle of winter. Yeah, no, I, I like that very much because it goes quite close to the Japanese idea of tree bathing. And so yeah. what you do is you immerse yourself in the trees, in the forest. And it's that which is enormously healing, which is saying exactly the same thing that you've just said. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I think it's very important. Mm. I am I am just so um, not wanting to let this conversation <laughs> end because A, I wish you were right here so I could hug you. <laughs> That's <incredible. laughs> Yeah. But, um, I think that what I really wanted to accomplish in this conversation is um, is just letting my audience hear directly from both of you what you've learned and how all of us that are part of the deaf literacy movement need to go forward and to to um, support others in what we're all going to ultimately have to face and that 
what we've all said, it, there are so many things that can be done and options that are out there. And um, yeah, do you want to give us any like parting words of wisdom <laughs> before we end? Yeah, well, one parting word of wisdom. We have to, we have to end Freud's paradox. And Freud's paradox states that when you talk about death, you always talk about someone else's and never your own. As soon as we, we solve that, it'll make life a lot easier. Freud's paradigm, Freud's paradox. paradox. Freud's paradox. Absolutely. I, I know we, we do talk about somebody else's and, and we need to have that conversation about our own death, our own passing. And I mean, you know, I, I look forward to it. I'm not looking forward to it happening anytime soon, but I'm quite looking forward to the experience. It's, um, it's one more great experience. And um, we just, just want to do it together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the thing is that, I mean, coming from the tradition that I do, we've all done it so many times before. And that's my intuitive knowing is that it's nothing new. It's nothing scary and it's nothing I haven't done before. And um, it might be a topic for another um, podcast because I, I'm sure it can go on for, <laughs> for, for, <laughs> for <laughs> long. But you also talk a lot, a lot about um, reincarnation and that's an interest of yours. Yeah, may... And it's just something that you would like to to um, give us a little bit of podcast number two. We'll do reincarnate. <laughs> give us a taste of what you're thinking is on that. Well, anyway, I'm going to hold this book up, The Art of Dying, by this wonderful couple. And if you could just, you know, educate yourself, you know, and reach out. You know, there's just so much out there and help others, you know, particularly at this time. And I want to thank you, Peter and Elizabeth, so much for being on the Dying Your Way podcast. And um, just lots of love. And thank you so much for the work that you've done for the world. We just can't thank you enough. Mm -hmm.